Welcome to another show of this week. We start our show by shedding light on human rights issues in South Sudan. We follow three human rights commissioners who have been in South Sudan for at least a week. This is what we found out. The three human rights commissioners who were mandated in March this year by the UN Human Rights Council to monitor and report on human rights situation in South Sudan traveled to Malakal and Bentiu. At the end of their trip, they are expected to and make recommendations for the improvement of human rights concerns affecting the country. While in Bentiu, the head of Human Rights Commission said one concern was that impunity would continue in the country unless there is accountability. One message that is coming through is that impunity will continue in South Sudan unless there is accountability. We believe that in the visits we make around the country, we will be able to relay this back to the Human Rights Council and to make recommendations about what needs to be done. The team visited protection of civilian sites in Malakal and Bentiu and met with political and community leaders, internally displaced people and humanitarian workers on the ground. Commission member Kenny Scott said the situation in the Bentiu protection of civilian site was tragic. No matter how much you know about the suffering that's, been, that, that's happened here in South Sudan, how tragic it is, it becomes new to you again when you see the people, when you talk to people and you hear their stories. And I think all of us come away feeling more determined to really address the situation, to make sure that accountability happens. Godfrey Musila said the commission would advocate for various issues. We would be advocating for accountability for what has happened in South Sudan. We'd also be advocating not only for prosecutions uh, under the hybrid court and other mechanisms, but also the need uh, for ordinary South Sudanese to talk, to sit down and talk um, under a Truth and Reconciliation Commission but also for the needs of victims who have suffered, who have lost property, who have lost livelihoods to be taken into consideration under the uh, reparations authority that is proposed under the peace agreement. The team also met with senior government officials, a number of ministers, parliamentarians, police, judicial officers and military officials. Following their visit to South Sudan, the commission will travel to Addis Ababa where they will meet leaders of the African Union, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, as well as other members of the international community and civil society. The team will also visit South Sudanese refugee settlements in Uganda. Before leaving the country, the Human Rights Commissioners held a press conference in the capital Juba where they highlighted their concerns. Here are snippets from the press conference. Concluding their first visit to South Sudan, the United Nations mandated human rights mission expressed deep concern over rights violations among a list of other issues. The commission remains concerned by the following issues. The diminishing space for civil society, which includes ongoing intimidation and harassment of its members, forcing many of them to flee to neighboring countries. Media freedom and the continued intimidation and harassment of journalists and of course media houses. Restrictions placed on access by UNMIS, um, on access for UNMIS and the humanitarian actors, which really inhibits their ability to reach the most vulnerable in order to carry out their work. The escalation of sexual violence against women and girls perpetrated by armed men in uniform. The ongoing impunity and lack of accountability for serious crimes as well as human rights violations and abuses in South Sudan without which we all know lasting peace cannot be achieved. Yasmin Suka also noted the slow implementation of the August 2015 peace agreement between rival political factions. The Commission is also deeply concerned at the slow progress on the implementation of the provisions of the peace agreement, which is fundamental to ending the conflict, human rights violations and normalizing the lives of South Sudanese. In meetings with government officials, the Commission members touched on critical issues of accountability, 
particularly in respect to previous and current investigations and inquiries that the government has either conducted, instituted or committed to. Some of the issues brought up also included the establishment of a hybrid court for South Sudan, the bill amending the penal code to incorporate international crimes and the establishment of the Commission for Truth, Reconciliation and Healing. Speaking at the press conference, one of the commissioners, Kenneth Scott, made a strong appeal to the government and the African Union to immediately establish mechanisms dealing with transitional justice, accountability and reconciliation and healing as stipulated in the peace agreement. The ball is squarely in the African Union's court to establish the hybrid court. They wanted that responsibility and the, when the peace agreement was negotiated, they insisted on having that responsibility. And it is their responsibility to put that court in place. Uh, it is also the Republic of South Sudan's responsibility under the peace agreement to put the Truth Commission in place and to put the reparations authority in place. So those obligations exist now and have existed for the past 13 months. And those issues with getting those bodies put in place cannot be blamed on the UN or the Security Council. We call on again the African Union to move forward as quickly as possible, with great effect, to establish the hybrid court. And we call on the government of South Sudan to establish the Truth Commission and the Reparations Authority without further delay. The Commission plans to return to South Sudan later this year before reporting to the Human Rights Council in March 2017. At a press conference in Geneva this week, the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, said the number of South Sudanese refugees in neighboring countries has reached the one million mark. Our next story highlights this. This number includes more than 185,000 people who fled South Sudan since fresh violence erupted in July this year. Speaking to reporters in Geneva, the UNHCR spokesperson Leo Dobbs said that this is a sad milestone five years after independence. The number of South uh, Sudanese refugees sheltering in neighboring countries has passed uh, the one million mark, including more than 185,000 people who have fled since fresh violence erupted in South Sudan uh, in Juba on July the 8th. Um, five years after independence. This is a very sad milestone and we uh, again call on all the actors involved to step up efforts for a, uh, to forge a durable uh, peace, peace pact so that people can start rebuilding their lives and returning home. Dobbs said that South Sudan also joins Syria, Afghanistan and Somalia as countries which have produced more than a million refugees. The violence in July has set back peace efforts in South Sudan. The fighting has shattered hopes for a, for a real breakthrough and triggered new waves of displacement and suffering over the past few weeks. And uh, organizations such as ourselves are finding it very difficult uh, for logistical security and funding reasons to provide the protection and assistance that, uh, that is needed uh, uh, by the refugees and uh, the 1.61 million internally displaced. Most of those fleeing South Sudan are women and children. They include survivors of violent attacks, sexual assault, children who have been separated from their parents or traveled alone, the disabled, the elderly, and people in urgent need of medical care. Dobbs highlighted neighboring Uganda's role. Uganda is hosting the lion's share of uh, Sudanese refugees with 373,626, three more than a third of whom have arrived since uh, the fighting erupted in July. And they keep coming. Uh, more than 20,000 new arrivals were recorded uh, over the past week, mainly crossing from uh, the north, uh, at the northwest uh, point of Oraba. Um, and they have been uh, uh, confirming reports of increased fighting across the greater Equatoria belt in the south of, uh, of the country. As the refugee agency continues their work, they are calling on donors to provide 701 million US dollars for South Sudan refugee operations. 
of which 20% has been funded. They announced that without further funding and support, UNSCR and its partners will struggle to assist the refugees even with the most basic assistance. Following up on South Sudanese refugees, we see Olympian Yech Purbiel at an event on September 16th in which the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, handed the UN Secretary General a petition in support of refugees. Biel, who has been a refugee in Kenya's Kakuma refugee camp, was among a handful of other refugees at the event. Days ahead of the International Summit on Refugees, the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, got the attention of the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. The Secretary General took time to sign a petition in support of refugees and added his voice too. Some of our... We cannot let heartlessness expose so many children to deadly risk. We cannot let indifference condemn families to tragedy. We reject xenophobic rhetoric. We stand with refugees. Standing by the Secretary General among a handful of other refugees, actors and the High Commissioner for Refugees, Biel, who is a South Sudanese, highlighted some rights of refugees, saying the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya gave him shelter and a chance to build his life. The right to shelter is the foundation toward any achievement. We must strive for this right. I am a refugee, just like how any of you could become a refugee. And the right to a safe place to live should not be denied to anyone. Amy Mahamoud, a refugee from Darfur, read a poem describing the death of the Syrian child, Alian Kudi, who was found washed up on the Turkish shoreline last year. When I see the corpse of a stranger, that kind of death from the outside of someone else's final breath, it makes the air stop, the ocean turn more slowly, the earth a cradle, a cemetery, a monument, a stone, like a dead boy. The petition, which has been signed by over 1.2 million people, calls on world leaders to act with solidarity and take shared responsibility and find solution for those forced to flee from conflict and persecution. The petition calls on world leaders to ensure refugees had a safe place to live and could learn new skills to make positive contributions to their communities. It also called for every refugee child to receive an education. Our next item is a recent discussion on Radio Miraya by South Sudanese youth who are using street art to promote peace. They are campaigning under the hashtag Anataban, which is basically translated from Arabic as I am tired. Here is what they had to say. Uh, first of all, uh, Long John, tell us more about uh, this campaign. What is it all about? It's, it's an initiative by the South Sudanese youth, creative, creative youth, artists that is, uh, art, uh, actors, painters, drawers, musicians and all that. <coughs> Sorry. It is a campaign that they, come up, they came up with to try and be able to explain to the people of South Sudan, the youth particularly, that uh, it is us that really need to have this country moving forward. It's a campaign to push for peace amongst ourselves and, among our, and, and in our country. We heard it in house that, okay, it is our obligation to stop this war. We have been into decades of uh, war. Every time we're subjected to this war, it is us, youth, to stand up and work for the peace that uh, we need to achieve in this country if we want our children to be in the peace that we need mm -hmm. and uh, at least enjoy the fruit of this nation. What is the aim of this Anataban campaign? Any of you can respond. The aim is we need to speak up 
I mean, for the voiceless, the suffering and, uh, you know, the widows, the, the children that, uh, I mean, were subjected to all this suffering. We need to speak up for them and say enough is enough. Our aim is, you know, to stop this uh, hunger, you know, that is in house, you know, and every kind of suffering that is outside there. There's so many things that, uh, you know, we need to tackle. Who are the targets in this campaign? Maybe... Uh well, the targets are um, the youth, mainly the youth, that uh, because what we realize the youth are the majority that you know are facing the problem. They are the one either taking the arms and you know join the sides, you know. They, uh, they are the one fighting the war that they don't even know why they're fighting. You know, you instead of enjoying going to school. Uh, thinking of what tomorrow is like for them. They are the one mainly in all these things. We also targeting the women that, you know, they are the victims of, uh, could be rape, could be, you know, starvation, could be, you know, they've lo the losing husband that, you know, mm -hmm. should be working for them, but, you know, th we are, are targeting the children that are waiting for their fathers to come back home and, some will never see their fathers again. We are targeting everybody else. To be honest, like uh, whatever part of the world we are as South Sudanese, we all turning and tossing without sleep. What will you tell to a youth listening to you right now and is deep down there in the villages of South Sudan, he has no access to food, no access to uh, medicine, they, he can't go to school, his life is almost gone, the roads are blocked, and he's listening to you here saying you are launching a campaign tomorrow for peace in South Sudan, and yet he's now hiding for his dear life. What do you tell them using this campaign? You need to come up as a youth, a strong youth, and speak up for your country, you know, and by the end of the day, you'll get to where you hope to be, and never lose hope because hope is the first thing in life. If you have that, then any time, any minute, any second, things can change and you, you know, you become uh, who you want to be. So we need to speak up. We don't need to be like a, a voiceless, you know, sit down. You know, we are the, we are the majority in this country as youth and we're the one who are being used. So why can we stay? No. We don't want to use this mm -hmm. and we need to listen to ourselves and do our own things as youth. We are the most powerful people in the nation. So in one voice, uh, I would like you to maybe pass your final message of hope. For the youth of South Sudan, this is your country, and uh, there is even if you have a, you know like uh, different nationalities, this is your country. You have to own it, and taking ownership of what belongs to you, it starts with respecting you as yourself and respecting you know the rest of the world and you know the country as well so i just want the south sudanese youth to take on ownership of the country so i'm just requesting our fellow youth and the fellow south sudanese that mm. together let's make history you know history is made when the unexpected happens let's show exactly. the world that you're not a country of war okay mm. uh, jacob finally to keep our hopes alive uh, we still have our country and we can you know still achieve what we need to achieve so let's be together and, you know, uh, appreciate our diversity. Yet again, we will end our show with our voices of peace and with the hope that you will join us again next week. Goodbye for now. It is a pity. Uh, it is a pity that uh, we are losing humanity. Uh, this question is very touching. Uh, we, are losing, uh, we are losing our humanity, and uh, that, that heart of humanity is not there. Sometimes you find that uh, children are killed, women are killed. In, in other countries, you hardly hear of a woman, you hardly hear of uh, a child being killed. This one is happening in South Sudan. My heart bleeds when I see our citizens even are afraid of the custodians of the law, uh, the organized forces. The organized forces, uh, people should see them as friends. Uh, people should see them as people who really guarantee their freedoms. We South Sudanese, 
we should uh, embrace ourselves, we should love ourselves, we should accommodate ourselves. We have the Nile, the great Nile, we are on the Nile. Sudan is using the Nile and uh, Sudan has the biggest sugar uh, factory or company in, in, in Africa. Egypt is using the Nile, but we probably who are the owners of the Nile, we are seeing the Nile uh, just passing. And we are, we are, we are throwing even dirt into, into, into this Nile. Time has come for us to protect the Nile and to protect our environment and to intensify agriculture because it is the backbone of our economy. Thank you.